If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to grab them and open up to Mark's Gospel, the second Gospel account in the New Testament. We are beginning a journey, and Lord willing, we plan to spend most of our year together, 2023, in this Gospel. Throughout the remainder of the winter, on into the spring, throughout the summer and fall, we're planning to navigate and spend so much time unpacking the truths of Jesus that Mark presents in this gospel. So this morning, we'll be in Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at the first 15 verses. And it's interesting. You know, if you're new to studying the Bible, or if you've been studying it for years, it's always helpful to be reminded of the big picture of what the Bible's all about. What the Bible is all about. That sounds like a good title for a book, yeah? Well, for me, it was a required book when I was going through Bible college. It's author Henrietta Mears. Anyone ever heard of old Henrietta? A couple people? We're going to reference her a little bit this morning a couple times. Henrietta Mears is an amazing woman. Billy Graham, anyone heard that name? Okay. Well, Billy Graham called at the exclusion of his mother, Henrietta Mears, the greatest female influence on his life and one of the greatest Christians he ever knew. If you ever check about a, bi a biography or learn a little bit more about her, you'll see the tremendous influence she had on many great Christian leaders in the 20th century. But she had this great way of kind of bringing clarity, speaking simply, well, like her book title would share, what the Bible's all about, to kind of give insight into God's Word. And this is one of the things that she said. She said, the Old Testament is an account of a nation, the Hebrew nation. The New Testament is an account of a man, the Son of Man. And the nation was founded and nurtured of God in order to bring the man into the world, and God himself became a man so that we might know what to think of when we think of God. His appearance on earth is the central event of all history. Amen. The Old Testament sets the stage, and the New Testament describes it. That's what the Bible is all about. Starts with the letter J, ends with the letter S. What's the answer, church? Jesus. The Bible's all about Jesus. The Old Testament sets the stage. The New Testament unpacks who Jesus is to us and for us. And the New Testament begins with four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four accounts of the life of Jesus. Now, these accounts aren't necessarily biographies, but they're gospels. You may say, well, what's the difference? Well, a biography can simply be the account of someone's life written by someone else. But listen, the Gospels are extremely selective. At the time that the Gospels were written, writing materials were precious. Space limitations were a reality. The entirety of whatever was written had to fit on a specific scroll. And what Jesus did in his time on earth, well, listen to how the Gospel of John describes Jesus' life on earth. In John chapter 21, verse 25, he wrote, if, if the deeds of Jesus were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. One author says about the Gospels that they were written with this thought in mind. If I can tell about only a few of Jesus' deeds and sayings, which will give the clearest picture of who he was? Which are the best ones? To simply put, the Gospels are the collection of Jesus' greatest hits. And that's kind of what the Gospels are. And this morning, we're beginning a journey through Mark's Gospel. Mark's Gospel shows us Jesus as the one who came to serve humanity. Serve humanity and give his life so that we could live. If you're wondering what's the anchor verse, what's the, the focus of the whole book, many would say it's found in actually in chapter 10, verse 44 and 45, where Jesus says this, whoever wants to be first among you, you must be a slave to everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others 
and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now Mark, this gospel that we're in, it's unique among the gospels. Luke was a physician, wrote primarily to a a Greek audience, a Greek culture. And and Luke really focuses on kind of the the tender-hearted ministry of Jesus. It's in the the gospel of Luke that we really see kind of this perspective and, and honing on the humanity of who Jesus is. I mean, the first couple chapters of the book give us the most information we know and description about the details surrounding his birth. Matthew was at one time a a tax collector. He was a Jew, and his primary audience was the Jewish people. So he opens that book with a genealogy, building a, a bridge to the audience that he's seeking to speak to. He's showing that Jesus really is the king of the Jews, the the rightful heir to that throne of David that they were longing for and looking to be fulfilled. And John, well, John was one of those disciples, Peter, James, and John. John was one of those disciples that seemingly spent the most, well, kind of close time with Jesus. And he opens with his gospel with this statement about eternity. And his purpose was to prove to the whole world, that's his audience, that Jesus is the Son of God. Every account in that gospel evidences Jesus as the one who became flesh and dwelt among us. Now Mark, the gospel that we're in, He wrote for a Roman audience, and he moves extremely, I mean extremely quickly through the life of Jesus. He he begins, we'll see this morning in just a moment, with an announcement, straight into the point of who Jesus is. I mean, speaking about how Mark wrote, one author says this, the gospel of Mark is fast-moving and hard-hitting, like living with a three-year-old or something like that. By, the, by far the shortest of the four gospels, it's noted for as much as what it omits as what it includes. I mean, in Mark, there's no genealogy, no miraculous birth narrative with Bethlehem and shepherds, no childhood at Nazareth or visiting the temple, no sermon on the mount, very few parables. Mark recorded in rapid-fire succession specific events from the life of Jesus. Why? What's the point here? To prove, primarily to a Roman audience, that he is the anointed one. The Hebrews would have said the Mashiach, the Christ. Christ is not the last name of Jesus. It's his title. He's the anointed one. He's the Messiah, the Mashiach, the Son of God, who served and suffered and died and rose again. You know, Mark, just a little bit about him. You may see as you kind of navigate the New Testament that he's actually got two names. Sometimes he'll be described as John Mark with John being his Hebrew name, his first name. He's not an apostle. You know, growing up, I always thought Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, yeah, those are some of the 12, right? Well, no. Luke was a physician that wrote down a lot of what he saw in the book of Acts and in the gospel of Luke. Mark was probably born 10 to 15 years after Jesus was born. And he's probably in his teens when all the events that he's recording here in the gospel actually took place. And Mark, the gospel of Mark, is primarily believed to be the perspective we're given into the life of Jesus through the lens of kind of a favorite apostle amongst those who study the New Testament, the apostle Peter. See, Peter led Mark to Jesus. He discipled Mark told Mark the story from his perspective. In fact, in the letter that Peter wrote, 1 Peter 5, he actually refers to Mark as almost like his son in the faith. Mark was actually the cousin of Barnabas, a key leader in the church. And Barnabas was a traveling companion, if you know a little bit about the New Testament, with the Apostle Paul in the early stages of the church where the gospel was going forth for the first time throughout the world. Churches were being planted. There were missionary journeys. And Mark, John Mark, accompanied his cousin and the Apostle Paul. And it was on that first missionary journey that we're we're not sure exactly what happened, but Mark left Paul. 
He left Barnabas. There was conflict. Barnabas gave John Mark a second chance, and eventually Paul and Mark reconciled. But it's interesting about Mark. His family seems to have a tremendous influence in the life of the early church. It was in Mark's mother's house, that story in Acts chapter 12, when they're gathering together to pray. And remember Peter's in jail, and they're praying that that Peter would be released. And I don't know if they were really thinking that their prayers had much impact or not, but an angel comes and knocks on the door, and, and then Peter's there, and that's actually at John Mark's mother's house. Mark, a young guy when Jesus was on earth, his life was radically changed by Jesus. His entire family becomes extremely engaged and active and vibrant in the community of the early church. Why do I share that? Because this kind of honest life transformation, this is what the Gospels are all about. Say, what do you mean by that? One author says this, the Gospel writers, you need to know this about them, are die-hard advocates of Jesus. But they didn't start that way. They came by it honestly. When they tell you that his sacrifice changed them to their core, they're not being manipulative They're being authentic. The Gospels repeatedly demonstrate that when neutral people met Jesus, he shattered their preconceptions and transformed their lives. So these aren't like Jesus' cronies going out, putting out his propaganda. That's not what the Gospels are. These are individuals who were radically changed by Jesus, and they want to get the message out of who he is. And so they gather all these different preachings, teachings, events, miracles, encounters with Jesus to show you who he is. Their lives were transformed. See, as you read through the Gospel of Mark, especially in this first chapter this morning, Mark wants to jolt his readers into an understanding of who Jesus is. And I think the goal of the book and our time in it, it's not necessarily just observation, right? Examination, information, but to engage with and to follow Jesus. It's my hope and prayer that our time in this gospel, that we will see Jesus in fresh and informative ways. And I've got to be honest with you, as a, as a pastor, as a teacher, I can't do that for us. I don't even think Mark can do it for us, but I believe the Spirit of God working through hearts that are open can do that. Can I say that again? I believe that the Spirit of God, with people who are awake in the middle of a sermon and their hearts are open, God can do so much with that. Mark's life was transformed. John's life, Matthew, Luke, these individuals who they encountered Jesus, either through Peter's you know, recount of all that happened, being there physically and seeing it, their lives were radically changed and transformed. And as we spend some time in this gospel, I'm praying for God to work in me. I'm praying for God to work in us so that we would follow him in fresh ways and see him. Dear church, let me say this. See him for who he really is. Because there's so much noise out there. Let's let the gospel speak for itself. Let's let the Bible show us who Jesus is, and let's follow Jesus of the word. Now, this morning, we're going to look at the first 15 verses of this first chapter. And they kind of set the stage for the book. Some would call it the the prologue of the gospel. And now, disclaimer for this morning, I was talking about it with, with Todd, who's teaching through this same section with the students. There's at least half a dozen sermons in this text. It's at least. There's so much that Mark covers. But we're going to focus on the main focus of what Mark shares. In fact, in the first verse, we see three big themes of the verse. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 This is what Mark writes, reading from the New Living Translation. He says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. 
This is the good news about Jesus. Now, some translations before you might say with this description opening that this is the gospel of Jesus. The gospel. Which literally means good story or good news. And if it's taken with kind of just that simple understanding, well, then there's countless number of things that come across our lives and into our lives that are presented to us with the promise of good news, right? Good news about fill in the blank, this new product, this new person, this new experience, like a, like a sales pitch or a, an advertisement campaign. Like, do you remember before there was an iPhone? Do you, do you, can you think back that far? <laughs> and like, Steve Jobs was a master at this to be able to kind of present the good news about, like, let me just share this with you, like 20, 30 seconds of what this was like, this anticipation about something that was new. These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. So Steve sets up this product, right? And it's like a picture. It's like a 10-minute presentation. I, I watched it just to kind of see, man, he really built this thing up. I just wanted to give you 30 seconds because I felt like it was inappropriate to take 10 minutes to show you the, the iPhone. But... My point was this, he's setting the stage for the good news about a product that's about to change your life. Is that what the gospels are doing? Like, here it is, it's about Jesus. This is, in some ways I used to think so. Like, okay, well, it's just a proclamation, but it's about Jesus, right? I learned something interesting about the word gospel this week that I wanna share with you. I'll put it up on the screen. It says, the word that we translate gospel is the Greek word for evangelion. Mark borrowed the words, listen to this from those who used it when proclaiming milestones about the emperor's life. Pop quiz. Who's the audience of the Gospel of Mark? Starts with an R, ends with an N. Romans, right? So right out the gate, he says, this is the good news about... Okay, these are, this word is used to proclaim milestones in the emperor's life. The emperor's accomplishments were treated as royal holidays, with heralds proclaiming the good news throughout the empire. This proclamation of a royal good news usually tied to a national day off. Who doesn't like that? It was known as an evangelion. Mark's use of that word, listen, would startle this first century audience. If there was an evangelion about Jesus, it meant that he had to be royalty, that he had to be king. In fact, this is exactly what Mark intends to imply, Jesus is king. Mark is fast-paced and hard-hitting in his gospel. And as soon as he opens up this gospel account of Jesus, he says, this is the good news about Jesus. Do you catch what he's doing here? He's not just opening up his gospel with a description, but a declaration. This is Jesus, the evangelion about him. What's the declaration? What's the proclamation? Well, look at the next few words. The Messiah. God had promised the Jews a Messiah who would restore their glorious status as God's favored nation. As a king, he would come from the lineage of Israel's best, strongest, most well-known King David. And this Messiah would establish a kingdom that would last forever. As a prophet, he would speak as powerfully as Moses did. And the Messiah would be one who would defeat God's enemies, restore the land to the Israel, restore the Jews to God. And this announcement about the royal one, this is a big deal to those who would have been first hearing this. This is the royal one, Jesus. He's the Messiah. And what does he say there? The son of who, church? The son of God. The son of God? What does that mean? I love what David Guzik says about this. He says, some people think when Jesus is called the son of God, it's a way of saying he's not really God, but, but something less than God. 
But in those days, to be called the son of something meant you were totally identified with that thing or person, and their identity was your identity. So when Jesus called himself the Son of God, and when others called him that, it was understood as a clear claim, clear claim to his deity. See, some people believe, well, Jesus, you know, he never really claimed to be God. Those around him, those who were even opposed to him, they understood what he was saying. I mean, if you read the Gospel of John chapter 10, let me read this account to you. He says, the Father and I are one. Once again, the people picked up stones to kill him. Jesus said, at my Father's direction, I've done many good works. For which of these are you going to stone me? And they replied, listen to what they say. We're stoning you, not for any good work, but for blasphemy. You, a mere man, claim to be God. Mark is very clear. This first verse just slaps you in the face, so to speak. It's a declaration, a demonstration that Jesus is the Son of God. As we go through this book this year, you're going to see him evidence through that by forgiving sins, the ability to control the elements of nature, the ability to overcome disease and demons and death. Even in our chapter this morning, we'll see in a voice, an audible voice from heaven affirming who Jesus is. And ultimately, it climaxes with the resurrection. This is who Jesus is, the Son of God, the Messiah, the royal one. Packed into this very first verse, Mark proclaims three powerful truths that, listen to me, the gospel of Mark will continue to unpack as we go through it this year. This is the good news about Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. Now, in verses 2 through 11, Mark gives three different witnesses to the truth that we just shared. Three witnesses to the good news. Three witnesses to Jesus as the Messiah. Three witnesses to Jesus as the Son of God. The first one, verses 2 and 3. Look at what it says. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is the voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. You see, verse 2 and 3, does anyone know who they're talking about? John the, John the Baptist. Yeah, it's a clear reference to John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. We'll read more about him in verses 4 through 8. But here's the point. Jesus' life, his ministry, his position as the Messiah the Son of God, these were all things attested to, prophesied about long before Jesus ever showed up in Bethlehem. The story of Jesus, as Henrietta Mir said, his appearance on earth is the central event in history. The Old Testament sets the stage. The New Testament describes it. This was prophesied. Hundreds of years before Jesus ever stepped on the scene as Messiah, as the Son of God, as the one whom would have a royal announcement, the Old Testament prophets were witness to this truth. One scholar, J. Barton Payne, has found as many as 574 Old Testament verses that somehow point to or describe the coming of the Messiah. Another gentleman, Alfred Edersham found 456 Old Testament verses referring to the Messiah or the times of his coming. And one person shared that conservatively, Jesus fulfilled at least 300 of those in his first coming. Now, I found this list online. They're, they're just going to put it up on the screen for you just to kind of give you evidence to some of the things. You won't be able to read this right now, but some of the ways in which Jesus either through prophetic fulfillment or typology, fulfilled all the different things that the Messiah would fulfill. And this list is an attempt to kind of give the types and prophecies from the Old and New Testament of what Jesus accomplished. Things like the fact that Jesus would be the Passover lamb, 
That, that the rock that produced water for Israel points toward the living water of who Jesus is. That there'd be a prophet like Moses who would come. Or that Isaiah, that picture in Isaiah 53 of a suffering servant describes Jesus almost to the T. See, the evidence of prophecy concerning Jesus is overwhelming. Overwhelming. Perhaps you've heard of Professor Peter Stoner of Westmont College. He, along with the support of 12 different of his classes, examined just eight prophecies of Jesus. And they estimated that one man, one man, actually fulfilling eight prophecies that were given about him, the probability of that is one in 10 to the 17th power. I mean, prophecies like this, did anyone here choose where you were going to be born? Did you have control over that? You haven't gotten that far yet technologically, right? You can't pick that on a list. Oh, where do I want to be? No, not there yet. Nobody has control over that. A prophecy was given. What is that like, one in 10 to the 17th power? Well, there's this illustration. If you mark one out of 10 tickets, place all the tickets in a hat, thoroughly stir them up, and then ask a blindfolded man to draw one, his chance is what? One in... Yeah, okay. Well, one out of 10 to the 17th power? Suppose we take 10 to the 17th power of silver dollars and lay them on the face of Texas. They cover the state two feet deep. Now mark one of those silver dollars, stir the whole thing mass thoroughly all over the state, blindfold a man and tell him he can travel as far as he wishes. He must pick up the one silver dollar that has a mark on it. What are the chances of him getting that right? One author wrote this, just as the same chance that the prophets would have had of writing only eight prophecies, having them come true in any one man from their present day and time. Amen. Here's the point. The gospel makes this bold pronouncement about Jesus. It's a much bigger pronouncement than the iPhone. And here it is. This is the good news of Jesus. Oh, there's something attached to royalty here in that language. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. Here's the first witness. The prophets back this up. You do not check your brain at the door when you meet Jesus. We worship God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, with all of our mind. And when you look into the account of God's word, it exudes with this truth supporting that Jesus really is different. He really is unique. He really is the way, the truth, and the life. No one is like him. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's the one that this good news is about. And here's the first witness, the prophets. Now, the one whom Isaiah speaks about in verses 4 through 8, here's the second witness, the forerunner. Look at verse 4. Mark writes this for us. This messenger that was prophesied about was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. And verse 5 tells us all of Judea, including all the people from Jerusalem, went out to see and to hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes, his clothes were woven from coarse camel hair. He wore a leather belt around his waist for food. He ate locusts and wild honey. And John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. There is a lot that could be said about one guy used to call him J the B, John the Baptist, right? There's a lot that could be said about this guy. But true to form for Mark, his kind of fast-paced, hard-hitting description, Mark gives us kind of what we need to know about this forerunner of Jesus. Set yourself in the sandals of time of when John the Baptist shows up. He comes on the scene like an Old Testament prophet. The people from Jerusalem to Judea flock in droves to the wilderness to hear him preach. He was bold 
He was brash. You can read in the other gospel accounts that he's, he's speaking to everybody. He blasted Herod for his lifestyle. He blasted the religious leaders. And for all those who were coming to hear him, he had strong words for the people to repent. John's appearance, he's wearing coarse camel hair, a leather belt around his waist. One author says this, John's clothes were much like the prophet Elijah in order to distinguish him from the religious leaders whose flowing robes reflected their great pride and their position. But John's appearance reinforced his message. Elijah had been considered the messenger preparing the way for God. And that's what John the Baptist is doing. And his diet, locusts and wild honey, that's what you did to survive out in that wilderness region. This is a wild scene with a wild man out in the wilderness. He's in a rugged, desolate area along kind of the western shore of the Dead Sea. Anyone ever been to that area? Preaching to people that they were in a spiritual wilderness far worse than his place of preaching. He's calling people to confess their sins, to repent. And that's so much more than just acknowledging their sin, but agreeing with God's verdict of sin, that what God says about sin is true. And he's baptizing them. And they weren't getting baptized as Christians do today, but as Jews of that day did, as a, as a way to use a ceremony to demonstrate what was going on in their hearts. They wanted to be clean. See, for us, I don't know if we can catch this, but for John to be on the scene was a big deal. There had not been a prophet like this that spoke to, to, to God's people on behalf of God for hundreds of years. And John, he could have capitalized on that, right? Could have started making merch. Like, get the camel hair like John. Get the belt. You know, you got the locust lattes. They're, at, they're available after service. Reels of him dunking people. That's not what he did. For all of his greatness, look at what John says in verse 7. Someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. We don't know what that connotation really means in our culture, but in that culture, to untie the straps of someone else's sandal, that was the lowest of the lowest of the lowest position for the lowest slave. In fact, in some places, they had rules in which prohibited many servants from ever having to do that. And John says, I'm not even worthy to... See, this gives us a picture of how Jesus, Jesus is the culmination of God's plan. Great prophets came before him. Elijah was revered by all. John, Jesus would say, was the greatest of all. But they don't hold a candle to Jesus. There's no one more important to him than him. He is the central figure. Henrietta had it right. That's what I want to say. Jesus' appearance on earth is the central event of history. The Old Testament sets it up, and the New Testament unpacks it for us. And John, as the forerunner of Jesus, this is the second witness to the declaration of Mark's gospel. You say, what's the declaration? I hope you're picking up on it. It's this good news, this royal announcement of Jesus, that he's the Messiah that he's the son of God. That's why John says, I baptize you in verse eight with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. See, John's ministry, it was all preparatory. That's what he was there to do. But when Jesus comes, the entire person is transformed by the Spirit's power. Jesus brings forgiveness and the power to live for him. And we need so much more than repentance to save us. We need the indwelling and the power of the Holy Spirit to change our lives. One, one pastor said this. He said, each person who trudged back to the shore after John's baptism would have been drenched head to toe, the marks of water baptism dripping off their bodies. Jesus' intention, though, 
is to have the Spirit of God dripping off our lives. He comes to live with us, but also to give the, the gift and empower us to, for God's work on earth today. He lives inside of us, but will also flow through us to others. That's why Jesus came, to give us life and the power to live the life that only he can bring. And so Mark, he's making this bold, brash claim of who Jesus is, a royal announcement. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. The prophets back this up. John the Baptist prepared the way. And now he gives the greatest witness of all, the Father, the Spirit. Look at verses 9, 10, and 11. He says, One day Jesus came up from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. And as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. This is an amazing scene. Jesus arrives, shows up, it seems, somewhat, somewhat like unnoticed is what it, what it seems like in the midst of John preaching to the masses. And Jesus is baptized. Now, some people ask this question, why? Why is Jesus being baptized if he's sinless and John is preaching this message of repentance and people are kind of preparing their hearts for this coming Messiah? Well, Jesus here is at the very public beginning of his ministry, and he's affirming and recognizing everything that John is saying. Jesus is supporting, approving, validating who John is. And not a, though not a sinner, isn't this why Jesus came? To identify with us as sinners. Matthew tells us that John, you know, when he saw Jesus, he was hesitant to baptize him. He's like, what? You, you have no sin? But Jesus responded, this is proper to fulfill all righteousness. What do you mean by that? Jesus provides to all who come to him an exchange of their sin for his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 521 says this, God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's how all righteousness is fulfilled in Jesus. Now, for me, I never really noticed this before. As I was reading through the Gospel of Mark this week, what Mark describes, how he describes what happens with his baptism you know, I always kind of pictured the baptism of Jesus kind of like this photo. I mean, not to think that I think of it in cartoon. That's not what I mean by that. But that when Jesus was baptized, that maybe it was kind of a, ah, oh, you know, little, little keys were playing in the background and the sun just kind of parted this, the clouds and here comes the dove and they're all like chiseled, you know, like everything's just perfect, right? That's kind of how I thought of it. But Mark says the heavens split apart. The ancient Greek for this phrase is strong. It's the idea that the sky was torn in two. One author put it this way, being rent asunder. It's the most eloquent way I know how to say that. A sudden event. See, this is a much bigger deal than New Year's Eve in Times Square or fireworks at Disney or Fourth of July on Pensacola Beach it wasn't like, wow, there was this, you know, announcement. The sky ripped apart. The, the language here is strong, that it's almost like this, this big, bold, almost violent display. Listen, the heavens are opening up. And for Mark to describe the heavens this way, splitting and cracking open above Jesus, and an audible voice from heaven Coming in this moment, in this big way, it's like heaven and earth. The gap between is now opening up. And the Spirit of God comes upon Jesus, descending like a dove. And you heard this actual voice. You are my dearly loved son. You bring me great joy. 
Jesus, by the prophets of old, by this wild man, you know, front runner in the wilderness, by the Father and the Spirit is affirmed, validated, pronounced, declared, certified to be the one whom this royal announcement is made. This is the Messiah. This is God in the flesh. Mark comes out swinging in those first few verses of his gospel account. I don't know how he could be more clear about who Jesus is and how he's attested to, pronounced, declared, affirmed to be the Messiah. Royalty, the Son of God. And then look at how Mark closes out this introduction as we begin to kind of wind down this morning. Verse 12, it says, Then the Spirit compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness, where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. He was out among the wild animals, and angels took care of him. If you read the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, there's this detail of three specific temptations that Jesus suffered at that time, that he encountered, and that he resisted Satan by standing on the word of God. Mark tells us that this was going on for 40 days, 40 days of testing amidst wild animals and angels are attending him. Again, as I said this morning, you could probably preach a half a dozen sermons from all that's covered, but there's something to note here. One author says this, from Jesus's temptation, we can learn that following our Lord can bring dangerous and intense spiritual battles. It's not always roses and rainbows in following Jesus. But it warns us, we won't always feel good. There will be times of deprivation, loneliness, hostility. But it also shows us that our spiritual victories may not always be visible to the watching world. Above all, it shows us we must use the power of God to face temptation and not try to withstand it in our own strength. I, you know, I'm tempted to camp there. There's a whole other message there. But what's the point of what Mark is doing in this gospel? He's showing that Jesus is not only validated, but he's tested. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's this royal one. Here's the witnesses. And then he's tested. He's tested. And now... As it says in verse 14, later on, after John, speaking of John the Baptist, was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time is promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. Now, you probably wouldn't pick up on this just through a, a simple reading of what's going on here in Mark, but there's actually a, a one-year time gap between verses 13 and 14. Again, that, the Gospels are written not to give a, a biography of everything that goes on in the life of Jesus, but very select, very selective in this presentation of who Jesus is. Now, next week, we're going to unpack these verses, verses 14 and 15, in much greater depth. But I just want to give us for this morning kind of insight to what Mark's doing as he's closing out this introduction to the gospel. He's giving summary. He's giving focus. He's giving the central message of Jesus's message. You say, what do you mean by that? You know, if you were to ask most people, maybe most believers, what's Jesus's main message? Odds are you'll get a response like, believe in me and you'll be saved or, or love God and love others, Right? And those are things that Jesus taught. But I'd want to challenge you. If you were just to read through the Gospels, you would find that his core message was this. The time that God has promised, the kingdom of God, he often uses that phrase. He would say it's now. Say, what, do you, what does that mean? The kingdom of God is near. That was his message, and so he would give a response. So repent of your sins and believe the good news. What does that mean? 
The, the time of God, the, the kingdom of God is now. It's promised. Oh, my goodness. Set yourself in the sandals of those who are in that wilderness. They've got J the B in these crazy clothes, preaching as if Old Testament prophets would have done in the past, saying, prepare the way, the kingdom is coming. These people know their Bible. The kingdom is coming? The Messiah? He's going to rule? He's going to reign? This was explosive language filled with tons of meaning and implication for those that were listening because many of those Old Testament prophecies were familiar to them. The, 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 the one that was coming, the, the one that the people were waiting for, he would be a king like David. That's 2 Samuel 7. There would be a ruler who would bring everlasting peace and the knowledge of God would go throughout the whole world. That's the book of Isaiah. Jeremiah said that he would replace false shepherds and religious leaders. Micah said that he would take all the weak and the injured and rule righteously in Jerusalem. Zechariah 9, he's going to bring complete peace so that no military power would ever be needed again. These are the prophecies given of the kingdom of God that is coming. And what does Jesus say with these explosive words? The kingdom of God is now. It's got to put everyone on their toes. What? Okay, this has got to bring excitement. What's happening here? One author says this, the problem for those there arose in a misunderstanding of the nature of this kingdom. The kingdom of God began when God entered history as a human being, but the kingdom of God will not be fully realized until all evil in the world has been judged and removed. Do you remember a book that we just studied that kind of showed that to us? The book of Revelation, that there's a time that's coming. We know that the kingdom of God will be fully realized. But listen, Christ came to earth first as a suffering servant. He will come again as a king and judge to rule victoriously over all the earth. The kingdom of God, listen to this phrase, was as near as people's willingness to make Jesus king over their lives. How is the kingdom of God here now? He can rule and reign over your life right here and right now. Because your greatest need is not for every military foe to be dealt with. Your greatest need is not for peace on earth to come without peace with God first being established in your heart. Amen. That's where the kingdom of God starts. I love Pastor Nate Holdridge of Calvary Chapel Monterey. He says this, he says, of course, we know the end of the story, right? If you're reading through the Gospel of Mark, he didn't ascend to Jerusalem. He didn't usher in worldwide peace. The lion didn't lay down with the lamb. Instead, Jesus was rejected by Israel, by Rome. They crucified him. But it turns out this was all part of God's plan. Jesus was resurrected. He then departed the earth, and the Spirit was poured out on all his disciples. They went out to tell the world that belief in Jesus and his work on the cross would grant them entrance into God's forgiveness, his family, and kingdom. And one day, all the promises they waited for will come to pass. Jesus will visibly rule forever and ever. But that does not mean the kingdom is only coming in the future. We are to pray for his kingdom to come, but it has come. He can rule inside you. He can rule inside me. The greatest need for us is what we're going to celebrate this morning. We need a savior, someone who comes to deal a death blow to sense penalty and power in our lives. And so when Jesus arose on the scene and said, hey, here it is, the kingdom is now. That's what he's speaking about. And then we know the end of the story that one day the kingdom will be fully realized. See, if you're someone that likes to study theology, often this phrase is often used to describe the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is here and not yet. It's here and it's coming. It's now and it's just around the corner. The kingdom of God is near and it starts with your surrender to him. And so what is the response that Jesus calls? Repent of your sins. Believe the good news. 
You know, repentance isn't something you do before you come to God, but it describes how you come to God. We can't come into the kingdom, his rule and reign in our lives, without leaving a life of self and sin. You say, what do you mean? Like if you're in Pensacola, and I say, hey, come to Gulf Breeze. I don't necessarily have to say, leave Pensacola and come to Gulf Breeze. To come to Gulf Breeze is to leave Pensacola. And if I haven't left Pensacola, then I certainly haven't come to Gulf Breeze. Does that make sense? <laughs> That's how you come. You say, I'm leaving my life. I'm following you. He's talking so much more than moral renewal. He's talking about trusting God, taking him at his word, living a relationship of dependence upon him. See, belief speaks of relationship and dependence. Uh, we'll close with this. In his commentary, Pastor David Guzik says this, there are many people who would believe the gospel, but they don't rest in it. They don't believe in it. This was an appeal not only to accept it as an intellectually accurate statement, but to rest in, to repose. It was a call to let the heart find its ease in the good news of Jesus. The kingdom of God is now. That's the message of Jesus. I, some of you go, man, I don't know if I, I read through the Gospels. See how often Jesus speaks about the kingdom and then how he unpacks it. Often you'll see him say, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. That trusting, dependent relationship upon him where he rules and he reigns in your heart. And one day, that'll be physically expressed everywhere where the lion and the lamb lay down. Where his rule, is, his rule and reign is done in perfect righteousness. See, let me share this with you. If I could summarize everything we've looked at this morning, the message of the gospel of Mark, he lays it out here in these first 15 verses. This is the royal announcement of Jesus. He's the king. He's the Messiah, that anointed one. He's the son of God. And Jesus, by the prophets of old, witness number one, by that wild forerunner in the wilderness, witness number two. By the Father in the Spirit, witness number three. Is affirmed, validated, pronounced, declared, certified to be the one of whom this royal announcement is made. This is Messiah. This is God in the flesh. Jesus was not only validated, but he was tested by the enemy. And so what's the message for us today? kingdom of God is now. It's now. So repent of your sins. Believe the good news.